Hi everyone, I'm Gina Lorenz. I'm Paul Quiat. We are physics professors at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and we're really excited to celebrate with you today the launch of the first publicly accessible quantum network. So, <laughs> all right, so on the screen, if you don't mind, Paul, Thank you. On the screen we see a map of Urbana and Champaign, and then specifically you can see these red lines. These red lines are fiber optic cables that bring internet to our homes and businesses throughout the cities. And um, what are fiber optic cables? Well, they're really thin threads of glass that carry light, and that light itself carries information like emails to our computers. Um, the reason we need these cables is because Wi-Fi only works over short distances. So for really long distance communication, we use these fiber optic cables. Today we're celebrating the fact that we're also able to send quantum particles of light. That's the smallest bits of light, also through the same cables. And what we're doing is we're bringing that from our labs at the UIUC campus over here to the Urbana Free Library and back. And what that does is it shares something called entanglement. Entanglement is a critical feature of 21st century quantum technology that's coming our way. And so this is the first public access point to that technology to help to bring it out here so you can learn about it and you can contribute to the formation of it. Um, so this is the first time in history such an access point to a quantum network has been installed in a public institution. Yeah. Uh, so there are a handful of quantum networks throughout the world, but they're all research-grade networks when only accessible to researchers. And so starting today, anyone can come to this library and interact with cutting-edge quantum technology and do the test for themselves that got the Nobel Prize just last year. Okay, um, and by interacting, we hope that you will contribute to how the technology evolves and is formed. Now, before we get started with kind of explaining more about the quantum network, um, we're going to have a few words from representatives of the organizations that have been involved. Um, specifically, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, the Urbana Free Library, uh, the city of Urbana, and the organization behind the fiber network on which the quantum network is built, UC2B. Uh, specifically, we will hear from the co-chair of the board of directors of UC2B, Paul Hickson, a bit later during the presentation. We're so thankful for their partnership, which is critical to this quantum network. Um, we'll also hear, uh, starting uh, now, from uh, Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at UIUC, Susan Martinez. Uh, just one moment. And then uh, next, after that, we'll have the Dean of the Granger College of Engineering at UIUC. UC Rashid Bashir, then the mayor of Urbana, Diane Marlin, the executive director of the Urbana, uh, uh, sorry, the Urbana Free Library Board of Trustees Vice President, Beth Scheid, the executive director of the Urbana Free Library, Celeste Choate, and I, I'd like to also thank uh, Rachel Spencer and Brian Zilm, who have come to us from U.S. Representative Nikki Budzinski's office. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, and so with no further ado, um, let me introduce Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at UIUC, Susan Martinez. Thank you. Everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Just want to make sure. Okay, thanks. Um, again, I'm Susan Martinez. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and, um, and Innovation at the University of Illinois. This is an amazing day, and I just want to emphasize that we're doing it first here in Urbana to make uh, a public quantum network available to all. This is just so exciting. Uh, when I was in grade school, a very, very long time ago, I remember hearing the story of Alexander Graham Bell. Do many of you remember this, that first phone call? Um, in 1876, Alexander Graham Bell made the world's first phone call. I had to verify it with the Library of Con Congress, but his first words were, and I want to get it right, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. This is what we're going to do today, and this is what's going to go down in history. It took a few decades, but that first phone call changed the world. Now, I don't have a crystal ball, but if I predict that we are about to witness a very similar, game-changing, transformative moment, not only for Urbana and Champaign and the state of Illinois, but for the globe. This is really cool. It's so appropriate that we're here at the Urbana, Urbana Free Library, accessible to all. Uh, uh, for all of you uh, to join us and witness this moment. 
Who knows what new ideas you'll imagine uh, for the future of quantum technologies? The University of Illinois was founded to serve the state, the nation, and indeed the world. Um, but we need your partnership to fulfill the mission. This is what we do. We invent and we create. At Illinois, we figured out uh, how to put the first pictures on the internet right here in Champaign-Urbana. We figured out ways to image uh, the bones in the brain. When you go and you get an MRI, remember that it started here. We wrote the playbook for that. We help farmers feed the world. We help doctors diagnose diseases. And we've advanced the tech that powers our daily life. But most especially, we're really committed to positive change in the communities that we serve. And that's one of the reasons I'm so glad to see all these faces. We're deeply grateful to the library. Uh, we're deeply grateful to the city of Urbana. Uh, and UC2B, the vision that was there for UC2B to put us in this position, for your partnership and your collaboration to host this event. So it took nearly 40 years for Alexander Graham Bell to make a transcontinental phone call and the rest, as they say, is really history. Quantum technologies, you may not understand that, but there's a lot of work on it. There's a national emphasis and a lot of investment. And we have the world's greatest quantum physicists, material scientists, um, uh, chemists um, here in Urbana working on this. So I predict it's going to evolve at a much, much faster pace uh, than the 40 years it took for that first transcontinental phone call. I hope that in just a few years, you'll be able to think back on this moment and say, I was there. I was there when we launched the first public quantum network, and I was in Urbana for that event. Thank you very much. That's OK. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. And um, next, we'll hear from the Dean of the Granger College of Engineering at UIUC, Rashid Bashir. Great. Thank you, Gina. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. So I have to do this, all right? ILL. ILL. Okay. Thank you. This is really one of those historic moments, uh, as I think Susan just so well articulated. Uh, this is the first, I don't know if we still appreciate and understand the importance of this, the, f the first you know, publicly accessible quantum network. As Gina said, these are available only in research labs, but now here the public can interface with this. And as Gina and, uh, and Brian and others earlier told me and Paul, this will also be a living lab really, the idea that this is all connected and we'll do sort of real experiments with this network. So this is really a very, very proud moment. Um, my name is Rashid Bashir. I'm really privileged and humbled to be the Dean of the Granger College of Engineering. Uh, we just have so much to celebrate today, um, not the least of which is this long-standing tradition uh, of our campus, really, uh, to push scientific boundaries and really try to be the first in doing really impactful things. Um, I just came from a ceremony, actually, some of us were there, Susan and others, um, honoring uh, Professor Tony Leggett, who is our, the one current living Nobel Prize winner. We just named an institute of condensed matter theory after him. And again, uh, he actually uh, did some of the work years ago of how we test for entanglement, which is really the basis of this celebration here today. So these things are all connected and they build on each other. Uh, we're all so proud to call John Bardeen, who developed the theory of superconductivity and other quantum phenomena, one of our own, right? One of the few people in history to have won two Nobel Prizes. Um, I'm just so delighted that we have now a new generation of physicists currently in our faculty, but also in the audience here. Uh, as I tell um, folks when I talk about physics, is if you really learn physics, you can go do almost anything. So I think those of you who are thinking about different majors, think of physics. Um, and I'm delighted that, again, this new generation of physicists and others who are committed to both making new discoveries and enhancing STEM education in our community. This is really important. Our researchers and faculty are just not doing this in the lab. They are actually bringing it to the public. This is really, really important, enhancing STEM education in our community, K through 12, or rather Q through 12, as I've been educated to say. Uh, this project is a perfect example of both. Uh, our visionary faculty, led by Gina Lorenz and Paul Kiewit, I think we should give them a big round of applause and have them stand up. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, who have been the first in the nation and the world, perhaps, to make this technology, this technology accessible to everyone. Uh, we're really grateful to the library um, for supporting our efforts and to the UC2B representatives who uh, have worked with us very hard to make this possible. Uh, it's very exciting that this network, which we are launching today in Champaign-Urbana, will ultimately connect with nodes in Chicago. And we also welcome our colleagues from the Chicago Quantum Exchange, uh, who we are proud to count as wonderful partners in many quantum endeavors, and who will be instrumental in the success of the network. Uh, quantum is really something that the state of Illinois as a whole, and we and Chicago together, have really put a big, big bet on and made a lot of investment, and it's paying off. We have uh, four of the ten national centers in quantum technologies within the state, um, and we are really known as the national leaders collectively from the state of Illinois in this domain. And this today is one other really great example of that in, when it comes to quantum networking and quantum communications. Uh, with the support of the state of Illinois, our researchers are really leading the way in developing new quantum science and technology. So I just want to congratulate Gina, Paul, and the entire team of the iQuest. Um, uh, thank you all for everything that you're doing and continue to do, and thank you all for joining us today. ILL. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rashid. And next we have the mayor of Urbana, Diane Marlin. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I mean, this is an historic occasion and it's one of the most, why I love living in Urbana is we often get to experience historic occasions. It seems like yesterday, but it was almost a dozen years ago that we began to link community institutions like, like this library and the University of Illinois to a high-speed broadband network called Urbana-Champaign Big Broadband, or UC2B. That connectivity was really transformative in our community, and it continues to have that impact. And then today, we're celebrating another leap forward in our digital technology, in quantum technology. The university is, and I think we can say this over and over again today, the university is linking the Urbana Free Library to the first publicly accessible quantum network in the world. And until someone uh, proves differently, we're going to stick with the world. <laughs> and usually when you say it first, you, you're way ahead of the game. So um, usually when I'm asked to speak at something, I have a, a, at least a reasonable idea of what I'm talking about. I have to say, <laughs> I'll admit, with quantum technology, I don't know a whole lot about it. I do know there's, I do know there's a lot of photons coming through that window right now. <laughs> but um, I, I turned to some people. Paul Hickson from UC2B gave me a quick but very useful overview of what quantum, the implications of quantum technology might mean. Um, I watched the wonderful videos that Gina Lorenz and her team made. I texted my uh, brother-in-law who has a master's in physics. He's in his mid-50s now, but he explained to me that his master's thesis was entitled Quantum Electrodynamics Field Theory. Don't know what that is. Um, but he also explained that he was focused on particles bound in materials, not traveling in waveguides. So I'm not sure if he was much help, but he was fascinated by the fact that this was happening here today. And I'll more on him in a minute. Then, of course, I turned to the source of all information, chat GPT. And um, that's where the words start appearing. Long distance entanglements, um, superposition, quantum key distribution, and quantum teleportation. And those words, and many like them, um, especially in that wonderful book that Gina has put together, The ABCs of Quantum uh, Technology, um, will be as familiar to us as internet and broadband are today. But in terms of words, I think at this stage for me, um, here's what I know. We have all have a lot to learn about this newest leap in technology, and that's why we're here today. The important here's, words this afternoon for me are potential and exploration. A publicly accessible quantum network, and we gotta keep saying that over and over again because it's just amazing, um, has the potential to help us communicate 
to create, to work, to research, to interact more quickly, far more securely, more collaboratively, and really we're just limited by our, our imagination. It gives all of us a chance to participate in the exploration of this incredible new technology and contribute to its development going forward. It's going to take years, probably decades, before we see it fully realized, but you've got to start somewhere. And it, puts me back in mind of my physicist brother-in-law, who's now in his mid-50s, but um, he used to visit us back around 1980, 1981. He'd come down from Elgin, where he lived. Um, he quickly discovered by interacting, when he was like 13, 14. So um, he discovered through the neighborhood kids that they could get into the Plato lab on campus. Mm -hmm. And so every night, half the night, this kid hopped on a bike. He was on campus. Um, in the Plato lab. I never actually saw what it looked like, but um, he, he was there all the time. And a bunch of other kids in the community were as well. And, you know, the family referred to it as, oh, Joe's just playing with computers. And it, it maybe looked like play to us. It probably felt like play to him. But what he was doing was really exploring the potential of what that network and that technology did at the time. And it set the course for his career. And um, he now does things he can't talk about with the, the Defense Department. <laughs> but, but, but I think having that access to the Plato Lab and the freedom to just explore and, and play with it made a difference in his life and certainly set the tra trajectory for his career. So I see that's what's going to happen here. If it doesn't, then, then we need to fix it. But this is what can happen here, and it'll mean the same thing to children and young people and people of all ages. So anyway, if it's going to happen, it's great that it's happening here because so many other inventions and world-changing ideas have sprung up in this community. So I want to thank the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I want to thank the Urbana Free Library, and I want to thank the Urbana-Champaign <laughs> broad, big broadband network um, for, for bringing this opportunity for us today, and mostly for inviting us to explore along with you. Thank you. Uh, and, and I have to say, you had me at teleportation. I mean. <laughs> Thank you so much. Next, we have uh, the Urbana Free Library Board of Trustees Vice President, Beth Scheid. Thank you, Gina. So you're going to hear this again, but I don't think I'm ever going to get tired of saying it or hearing it. But the Urbana Free Library is honored to be the site of the first publicly accessible quantum network in the nation or the world. The Urbana Free Library has a history of making technology available to the community to promote digital equity and often as a first. Partnering with the University of Illinois over the years has benefited the university, the library, and most importantly of all, our community. The Urbana Free Library offered the very first off-campus public access terminal to the University of Illinois' online catalog, the LCS, in 1984. It was the first public library in the country which allowed patrons to remotely connect to a university catalog. Imagine this, 40 years ago, you could use the computer to find and reserve books. In 1994, it provided the very first public access terminal to Champaign County's sustainability network, CCNet, which is a forum where business leaders and citizens can learn about new technology, ideas, and business models associated with the emerging trend towards sustainability. In 1994, the library also began offering public internet access to the community through PrairieNet, which was founded as a free net. And some of you here I know were a big part of that. We might remember that. In 2013, the Teen Open Lab began providing opportunities for teens to explore different technologies after school in a pop-up mini fab lab makerspace. Students explore music recording, 3D printing, sewing, 
reading, drawing, crafting, gaming, filmmaking, or just hanging out. At the date of its 10-year anniversary in March this year, 28,000 visitors had participated in the Teen Open Lab. Now I'd like to invite Executive Director of the Library, Celeste Mutos, to come and tell you a little bit more about their Bell Library. And welcome to the Urbana Free Library. We're so glad to have you all here today. Next year we will be celebrating our 150th anniversary of community service and hopefully we'll see you back for all the celebrations of that as well. So more recently, Beth, Beth was telling you about the past, more recently the library has partnered with UC2B to provide a grant of additional Wi-Fi hotspots to our community members to bring internet to their homes because some people don't have internet in their homes. We circulate Vox books, which are a book with an audiobook built right in. It reads itself aloud to children and their caregivers to promote literacy and the love of reading. With your library card, thousands of digital books, audiobooks, magazines, and movies are available as technology. This is technological, this was never available before, and it's available via the library on your device. So you've got everything you need here to enjoy your library experience, even if you can't make it into the physical building. And you can attend programs online, do research online, and learn languages and prepare for tests online as well. The Urbana Free Library and libraries in general serve as essential community hubs and are uniquely qualified to combine public access, technology, and educational opportunities for all ages. It is through partnerships like this between esteemed researchers and those of us in public services directly on the front lines like this the technology can have meaningful impact. We encourage community members to engage with this new technology, the first public quantum network available publicly. And um, we look forward to seeing you here. Wonderful, thank you to all of the representatives that just spoke to us and we'll hear from um, Paul Hickson from UC2B a little bit later. But let's go ahead and dive in and learn more about this public quantum network. So Paul, Professor Paul Quia will join me up here. Um, so yeah, let's get started. I turned that off. So that was <laughs> all right, so light. You know, I mentioned light at the beginning. Light is what brings the information that carries the internet to our computers and our homes. And uh, we're going to be using light for the quantum network as well. Now, if you look at a candle flame, there are about 200 trillion particles of light hitting our eyes every second from a single candle flame. And if we were to snuff out that candle flame, that number would go down, down, down until there were just a few in the glowing wick. And what's amazing is our eyes are sensitive enough that we can see just a few photons in the dark room. So you know, quantum particles or light are not so far away from our everyday experience. We can see them with our own eyes. So uh, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about that light and how we can use it to encode information. So those particles, those are called photons, so I'll use that term all the time. And there's have a, a lot of different a lot of different properties. So one of them, for example, the color. That's maybe what you're most used to. There's the direction that a photon might be going. The property that we're going to use for our quantum uh, network right now is something you need a, some other tools to see, and that's the polarization of the light. The polarization is like the wiggle direction. So you could have the light uh, oscillating, wiggling left and right, so that'd be horizontal polarization, or up and down, so that would be vertical polarization, or it could be diagonal. Uh, could even go uh, circular, you know, go in a, in a corkscrew basically. So that is a very common um, sort of thing that we can, we can encode information in, but you need a tool to do that. So at the very beginning, uh, we passed out, or some of you grabbed these plastic glasses. And I'm hoping that uh, people have them. Uh, I don't know if we, we probably have a few extra we can pass out if anyone doesn't have them, because we're going to do a fun demo here. You. Okay, so we can pass these down. If you can pass them around behind. Thank you so much. Sorry. Yeah. Give just uh, a few seconds for people to get them, put them on. 
OK, so just for fun, I want you to put on the glasses, look at someone else with the glasses, close one eye, and then change which eye you have closed. <laughs> yeah, so look at someone else, close one eye, and then change which eye is closed. You should see that depending on which eye you have closed, the other person's eye, one of them is dark and one of them is light. So what's going on with that? So these, these, are, polarizing, these are polarizing glasses. Get, let people get a chance to see. OK, so these are polarizing glasses from a 3D movie, from an IMAX movie. One of the lenses, let's see, the, the right lens is transmitting horizontal polarization, and it's blocking vertical. And the left lens is just the reverse. It's transmitting vertical polarization, and it's blocking horizontal. When you look at each other and one of the lenses is dark, that's because they're crossed. It's being blocked. Why do they do this in the movies? In the movies, they do this so that they can project two images on the screen, one for the left eye, one for the right eye. The left eye only sees the left image. The right eye only sees the right. That's how they can sort of mimic a, a stereoscopic or a 3D effect. OK, so what I want to do now is actually look at the monitor. And you'll see that the monitor is bright with one eye and dark with the other eye. In particular, it's bright with the left eye and dark with the right eye. That's because that monitor uh, is vertically polarized. The light is vertically polarized. In fact, every monitor I think you've ever seen uses polarization. Cell phones, calculators, they all use polarization to control how much light you see. So polarization is not, is not a strange thing. It's a, it's a very common. A uh, phenomenon that we use all the time, but it can still have some very kind of strange features. So, what I want you to do right now is I want you to either close or cover your left eye so that you only have the eye that should look dark when you're looking at the screen. Okay, and I have here another polarizer, and if I hold this horizontal polarizer up, it's still going to look dark, right? It doesn't change. And if instead it's vertical, it still looks dark. But if I can hold it diagonally, now you can actually see. Why, why is that? Because when I, the light passes through this diagonal polarizer, when we measure its polarization to be diagonal, the very act of measuring changes the polarization of the light. It changes it so that it's now diagonally polarized. If you look with both eyes now, so you can uncover both eyes, you'll see about the same amount of light with both of, the, with both of your eyes. Why is that? It's because the light, when it's diagonal, it's a superposition of being both horizontal and vertical at the same time. It's both of them at the same time. And therefore, there's a, a chance that it'll get through both either the horizontal polarizer or the vertical polarizer on your eye. In fact, before it's actually measured, before it gets to your glasses, it doesn't have, it's in a superposition. It doesn't, it's, not, it's neither horizontal nor vertical. It's both. It's the act of going through the glasses that, that measures it and kills the quantum superposition. OK, so everything we've just talked about, that was superpositions of single particles, single particles of light, single photons. What we're going to do now is talk instead about having pairs of photons that are entangled in their polarization. That's right. And you can take off your polarizing glasses now. OK. So we've talked about photons, which are these particles of light. Louder, louder. Louder. Great. And we've talked about superposition, this uh, concept that a photon can be both horizontally polarized and vertically polarized at the same time. We saw that when it could go both through, uh, it could go through our right lens or our left lens when you made it at that diagonal polarization. And now we're going to talk about when you take two photons, they can be entangled. What does that mean? So I have represented two photons on the screen here. When two photons are entangled, they share a bond in which their properties are connected because of quantum physics. When we check or measure one of their polarizations, we find that the other photon's polarization is always the same. And it doesn't matter how far apart they are. As soon as we check one of their polarizations, the other photon's polarization becomes the same. So what does that mean? If we find that one is polarized by wiggling up and down, the other is polarized wiggling up and down. And if we find the other polarized right to left, then the other photon will be polarized right to left. And so it's kind of like this optical illusion. OK, so if we just focus on one of these cubes, it's in a superposition, kind of. You know, you, is it going up and to the right, or is it going down and to the left? 
right? It's kind of like in a superposition of those two directions. And if we consider two of them, just like two photons, it's easier to see them both going in the same direction, isn't it? I mean, if you work hard, you can make and maybe see them going in opposite directions, which is another form of entanglement. Entanglement doesn't just have to be the photons always going the same direction. Sometimes they might be going in opposite directions. But no matter what, whatever you land on, that's the state of those two boxes. It's very similar to the state of entangled photons. OK, so. Um, it's kind of like having two coins. Another analogy, let's say Paul and I share two coins and we're very distant from each other. And we flip our coins and we find they always end up heads, heads, or tails, tails. We never get heads, tails, or tails, heads. Now that never happens in, with coins, right? But it does happen with photons and other quantum particles. And that's the concept of entanglement. That almost sounds like telepathy. How did you know what I was thinking? Well, <laughs> so we don't have any scientific evidence for telepathy, but something like entanglement actually exists all throughout nature. It is not a, a, an uncommon thing. It's all over the place. But it's only very recently, in the last 20 or 30 years, that we've really been able to produce it controllably in our laboratories and be able to actually do things, do things with that. And entanglement is essentially the, it's like the quintessential quantum mechanical feature. It's the one that really makes quantum mechanics different from all of our normal uh, existences. And for those of you who are like fans of Star Trek, you know, warp, warp engines. So entanglement is like the warp engine for quantum technologies. It's a thing that really uh, enables it in coming decades, we hope, to be useful for Futuring, powering future quantum technologies like sensing, in communication, in computation, so over a whole range of uh, areas. So we can now do, for example, uh, secure quantum communication. So that's a, a, a resource and a capability that already exists uh, today. But soon, with some upgrades, we will be able to, even with, this, uh, with our existing network, be able to do <coughs> quantum teleportation. So that's not teleportation like you might be familiar with Star Trek again, uh, where we're sending people or anything like that. It means that we are teleporting information. We're teleporting information from a photon over here to a photon over here without having to take the original photon through the path. So it's kind of instantaneous across this gap. It turns out we can also do that now with atoms. So we can teleport the state of one atom over to another atom. And once we can do that, you see we now have a method by which we can link together different nodes into a quantum network. And so the goal of that then is to make basically a quantum version of the internet, a quantum internet. And that will then allow us to perform tasks that would be impossible with classical computers. Yeah, and, and because of the unique quantum properties that these uh, quantum systems can have. So it's still a very early point in the technology, so still definitely early days as far as that goes. But we feel it's very important to give people access to this and exposure to this at a very early stage uh, for a couple reasons. Because we, first, we want it accessible to everyone, not just a chosen few who have access to this in, in our fancy research labs. But the other thing is we hope that this will lead to new applications of these kind of technologies. And we want to ha have everyone to have a say in what those applications are like. So my favorite example is, is the cell phone. So the people who invented this had no idea of most of the applications. The guys who invented and designed the antennas and the electronics, they didn't know that you're going to use this to order pizzas or look at books from the library or figure out you know, what the traffic is going to be or what the weather is going to be. All of those are examples of the public and other people coming in and giving ideas to us rather limited-minded quantum scientists about what, we, what we'll be able to do, what the technologies will be. It's, this is going to be a very powerful technology going forward with quantum computing and, and other things like that. And that's important, but could also raise ethical uh, implications. And so it's very important that by introducing you, the public, to this, uh, we can start to identify what are those societal impacts, both positive and negative. We can have that conversation and start working towards a technology that is available to everyone, serves everyone, and is safe for everyone. <laughs>
Yes, and, and the Urbana Free Library is the starting access point for the public. It's giving you access to experiments that normally only happen in a science lab. And so people coming to the library can change these quantum particles, see how they behave according to the rules of quantum physics. And it's all thanks to a unique combination of factors. So, you know, it's thanks to physical infrastructure, the expertise that we have at UIUC, and wonderful community collaborators that this is possible. Um, the equipment we're installing is what was needed to manipulate the photons traveling through the library. The rest of the equipment is actually back on our labs in camp on campus. And so uh, we're giving access not only to the ability to modify quantum particles, but also access to equipment that's uh, otherwise not accessible to the public back in our laboratories. Okay, so today we'll further do the first demonstration to show that we indeed have photons going through the library and that they're entangled with photons back at our lab. We'll perform a series of measurements on both their polarizations and compare them to see if they are always the same. So this test will definitively show whether the photons are entangled or not showing we have established a true public quantum link. So let's go ahead. Let's see what we have set up. Oh, and I should add this one. You know, Paul made this point, and I forgot to put it on the slide. The hope is that we will have unforeseen applications from people like you. Great. So this is a map kind of showing where we are at the Urbana Free Library on the right and the Loomis Sorry. Laboratory of Physics on the left there. Okay, so that's kind of giving us an idea of how far apart they are. And now let's look and see what we have set up here. I'll go ahead and play this. All right, so back at Loomis Laboratory on the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign campus, in my laboratory there, we have an experimental setup where we're creating pairs of photons that are entangled. That little infinity sign represents that the pairs of photons are entangled. Now one of those photons goes through a fiber optic cable down through the ground, okay? So we're gonna see it go down from the laboratory into the ground. This is the fiber optic cable that's carrying the photon, and it goes past the traffic. Fortunately, light travels much faster than this photon is traveling. And then it goes into the Urbana Free Library, where we are today. It's flying out of the fiber through some equipment. This is called a wave plate. And you all can now rotate that to change the polarization of the photons that go through it. Here's an example of changing the polarization from wiggling left and right to wiggling up and down. Once that change is made, you can then send it back to us, uh, back the way it came, all the way up to our laboratory on campus, where we then measure and see, do they always end up the same? Do they always end up going to the right or going up? And we find, hopefully, that they always do. This is the demonstration we'll do today. And this is also the experiment that got the Nobel Prize last year. Okay, so let's go ahead. Right. So what are we leaving here at the library? What are you going to interact with? It's actually up in front of us, but not everyone can see it. It's on the screen, and it's com comprised of that thing that you can rotate that I called a wave plate. That changes the polarization setting that we're going to measure the photon at. So you saw it could rotate the polarization. And just by rotating this, uh, we can then control the, the, the photon that's traveling through the library. It's a remote control, so actually when you rotate it, something that's around the corner in the fiber network closet will be motorized and will follow the rotation that you've chosen with your own hands. Okay? And the reason why we have to keep it back there and not put it out in front of everyone is because it, entanglement is fragile. You know, if you touch the fibers or if you knock something, it will destroy the entanglement. So we keep that kind of out of the way, but this is still directly connected just remotely through, via Wi-Fi to that equipment. Um, and so a picture of that equipment is on the right-hand side. The yellow cables are the fiber optic cables, and the photon flies out of them through the wave plate that you're rotating remotely using this, and that's how you do your interaction. Okay, so now we will see if the photons are entangled using a version of what's called a Bell test, which was developed back in the 1960s by a, a person named John Bell for a measurement 
uh, combinations are required, two in the library and two back at the lab. And these results will show us how much entanglement <laughs> there is between the photons. You know, it's kind of like checking the gas level in your tank. If we have a level over 2.0, that's what this test tells us, then we have entanglement. We have quantum entanglement. If we find that uh, we get values less than two, that means there's no quantum entanglement. So our goal today is to get more than two for our test. Okay, so um, let's get started. Now we're gonna switch to a view that gives us uh, a picture of what's going on up here, what's going on around the corner in that fiber setup, which we've pulled out of the network closet, so you can all see it later if you want to. And we've also got a graduate student over at the lab, Keshav Kapoor, and his screen. So if I can just point out, Paul, top left, sorry, top left, that's what's right in front of us, yeah. Uh, bottom left, that's around the corner, that's Yu Jae Zhang, he's a graduate student, Hello, he's going to help us with this. Hi, you, Jay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, he heard you. <laughs> and then Keshav Kapoor at the top right, graduate student, over at the lab on campus. He's joining us via Zoom in real time. Hi, Keshav. In real time, hi, Keshav. All right, and then on the bottom right is his screen. So, um, right, so uh, Keshav, how, how are you doing over there? I. <coughs> Hi, Gina. Can you see me? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Great. And I can hear you, too. You know, this reminds me of the first phone call made by Alexander Graham Bell that was mentioned earlier, where Bell said, Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. Except I don't want to see or, or hear you via phone. I want to see if we have entangled photons coming from the lab over there to the library over here. So can we see these photons? So uh, we can't see it as they're invisible to our eyes, but we have instruments sensitive enough to detect them. <laughs> we might want to translate that. that. Yeah, so let me just translate what he just said, which is um, they're invisible to our eyes, but we have detectors sensitive enough to detect them. And so on the bottom right, we have a plot, and that's showing how many photons per second are making their way from the lab to the library <coughs> and back over to Keshav. And it's kind of like a heart monitor, except instead of tracking heartbeats, we're tracking how many photons we're getting per second back at the lab. Hey, Yuji, can you try, Yuji, block one of the paths, block the path of the photon. There we go. Oh, did you see that? Oh, and now unblock. Oh, they went up again. That's great. Yeah, so that means that we actually have photons coming through the library and going back to the lab. And when UJ blocks the path of the photons, you can see the counts going, going down on Keshav's screen. Um, right, so since Keshav is having some audio difficulties, I'll just uh, continue explaining what he would say. So. Um, so yeah, these photons that are going through the library are entangled with photons that he's keeping back at the lab, which means when a library photon is measured to be a certain polarization, the other photon that's staying at the lab is the same polarization. So we have a lot of critical thinkers in town, which is awesome. So skeptical people should ask, you know, how do we know, how do we actually prove that the photons are entangled with each other? How do we check that that's actually gonna happen? Yeah, and so um, it makes sense that since this is the first public quantum network, we should have someone from the public. And fortunately, we do have a volunteer from the public, Leon Wilson, who is the IT manager for the Urbana Free Library. Leon, do you want to come up here? Yeah. Come on up. Okay, so Leon, using the rotating wheel, please change the polarization measurement by making one of the ports as dark as you can. I see you've chosen diagonal as the port you're making as dark as you can. Great. And now, over where UJ is, that wave plate will rotate correspondingly. There it goes. So you've just changed the measurement angle at which we're checking the polarization of the photon going through the library. Now, if you just make another ch choice uh, on the other two, between these two, make one of those dim, that's the second measurement setting that we need to do the Bell test. Great, and I see you've dimmed vertical the most, and that's that setting, and there it goes. That's now turning to the proper setting. 
And now, you know, it'll take a while before we're ready to actually say what the value is because, you know, the photons that are coming from our lab on campus to here, they, they get lost most, most of the time. Actually, only 10% of the photons make it back to the lab. And so that means we have to count for a while. Um, we'll be counting photons for about three to five minutes, something like that. And once we're done, then we'll see the value. Thank you so much, Leon. <laughs> Okay, so while we're waiting, we can talk more about the quantum network. Yeah. Oh, I get to be a professor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go cool. for it. Yeah, so there's actually a really interesting historical connection uh, with all of this. So it was back in the uh, 1920s and early 30s that the concept of uh, entanglement kind of was first introduced uh, by one of the founders of quantum mechanics, uh, Erwin Schrodinger. And uh, Einstein, you've probably heard about him, he didn't really like that concept. He disliked the fact that in the example we're talking here, the polarization <laughs> example, that we're saying that photons don't have a definite polarization until we actually measure them. He wanted them to actually have values whether or not we measure them. And he also really didn't like that when I measure something here, it, it affects something over here. He called that uh, spooky action at a distance. And he really didn't like that. <laughs> but really between the 1930s and the next 30 years, it was your philosophical choice whether you wanted to say, okay, I think quantum mechanics is true. The photons don't have any values until we measure them. And then there's this instantaneous action at a distance, or instead you sided with Einstein who said, no, quantum mechanics just isn't the whole story. The photons, they know what polarization they have, even if we don't know, and we don't need to have any of this fancy uh, instantaneous connection. But then in 1964, this uh, theorist, John Bell, he discovered that there was an experiment that you could do that would tell the difference between those two interpretations, and that's called a Bell test. Uh, it took a little while, so it was only in uh, the early 1970s that the very first tests of entanglement using photons were done. And then about a decade later, uh, some st substantially better tests were done, but it, re it was really only 50 years later, it was really only in 2015, so very recently, that uh, people have been able to do definitive tests that definitively ruled out Einstein's interpretation of what was going on and conclusively demonstrated that entanglement is a real thing and that it really exists. And in fact, the, the, the last year's Nobel Prize the, in physics, the 2022 Nobel Prize, went to three of the physicists that were most important in, in the development of that whole thing. So over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of improvement in technology to the extent that we can now do a test like they did, like was done previously, but with the limited amount of equipment, both back in our laboratory, but also this limited amount of equipment that you see here and, and that was kind of over in the other equipment rack there. So that's going to then enable us with just a few components to be able to test this fundamental question, do we actually have entanglement between the library and between our, our labs back at Loomis? Right. And a critical reason why we can do this is because of this fiber network that's in the ground already and to give us more kind of background on what that network is and how it provided this capability um, we have the uh, co-chair of the board of directors of UC2B Paul Hickson um, I'm can you hear me okay um, I am fighting a cold, so <clears throat> I hope I don't uh, erupt in coughing. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the UC to be board of directors to express our appreciation to professors uh, Gina Lorenz and Paul Kuwait and their research teams, as well as our friends at the Urbana Free Library. This is a really historic event. Everybody's been talking about it. And we are privileged today to get a rare glimpse inside what, what I think is one of the most exciting cutting edge areas of science and do so right here in the Urbana Free Library. Now I can assure you that back in 2010 when Mike Smeltzer and Tracy Smith, and they're both here, raise your hands, okay. <clears throat> When, when they and their supporters were awarded a $26 million federal and state grant, along with $3.4 million in local match, to build this community's first fiber optic network, and you, saw, you see that image of the backbone there, even though they had lofty goals to catapult Champaign-Urbana into the 
front of the pack in the connected world of the 21st century and to unleash the collective potential that would come from university faculty being able to pilot cutting edge beneficial technologies with community partners, I know that those trailblazers did not have any notion that a mere 13 years later, UCDB's fiber would be a major contributing partner in this research group establishing the first public quantum public network. And they certainly didn't ever think that you would be here today observing an entangled pair of photons and actually being able to control the remote photon in terms of its polarity by changing the pol polarity of the local photon. This is real cutting edge science, folks. And as you heard, it's, it, it's what is the basis of the U of I. It's allowing us to partner with faculty members doing cutting edge work, allow citizens into the lab space, and it wouldn't be possible if you see to be hadn't developed the infrastructure that is in allowing this to, to take place. So back in 2010, when uc 2 b was launched, it was a simpler time in computing. All computers operated on binary-based coding. A circuit was either open or was closed. All coding was done with a one or a zero. And conventional thinking said that it didn't matter whether whatever was being described by that one or zero stayed, uh, stayed the same or it, it didn't. Those rules changed dramatically, and more importantly, the benefits to society extend into important new areas of discovery when one enters this new world of quantum computing. What UC2B did do was to build this wonderful 126-mile fiber optic backbone infrastructure with seven rings all homing back to campus and providing gig-level connectivity to 256 anchor institutions. That's why we have Parkland College, Willard Airport, MTD, the city government facilities for Champaign County and both cities, K-12 schools, public libraries, park districts, police and fire departments, major medical facilities including hospitals, and many social service agencies in our community have gig connectivity. Urbana Free Library was one of those original 256 anchor institutions. And today, uc to b the pri with our private partner, I3 Broadband, is nearing the end of the last mile build out of our fiber resources throughout every neighborhood in both cities. And so, our uc to b board is turning its focus to addressing remaining issues of digital equity and digital inclusion for all residents in the community. Access to high-speed connectivity and dependable computing devices has become a practical necessity for all people of all ages these days and for so many reasons and is needed in so many different ways. You all know that. It's in that spirit our hope is that one or more of the eager young minds that will be visiting this place and interacting with the public quantum network will have her or his imagination and passion for science stimulated and inspired in the way that Professor Lawrence's must have been when she was a little girl or Professor Quiat's must have been as a little boy. This really is an exciting time. I'm glad we're all, all here at this event. I'm glad we can all participate. Thank you so much for those uh, wonderful words. And now uh, we're going to check in with Keshav again. So we're going to switch screens here. Hey, is that a thumbs up as in the measurement is done, Keshav? Yeah? OK, awesome. Well, let's uh, check out what our degree of entanglement is between photons uh, sent from the lab to the library and photons kept at the lab. Two so the we we're trying, we're aiming for greater than two. Can I get your help to make a drum roll, please? Mm -hmm.
that is, that is fabulous. I will say, we could have faked that and put something. We absolutely did not. We did not know what that was going to be. And so we're super happy that we have demonstrated that we have a genuine entanglement link. It's, it's real, real, folks. Yeah. yeah. So we've shown not only that we... So this shows not only that there's a genuine entanglement link between the Urbana Free Library and our laboratories back on campus, but we've also shown that it's possible for people from the public to come and interact with this new technology. And so that's amazing. That's really great for us. Um, that's really just the beginning. So this whole installation will be permanently installed uh, kind of right over there in the back. So that's going to be a permanent installation in the library. So what can you do with that? Well, starting today, you can already play with the measurement settings like we have here and do your own test of entanglement. Uh, there are a lot of other interactive examples and elements that you can learn about quantum, the properties of the photons with. And in the near future, you'll be able to do more. So for example, we're working to make it possible for you to send secure communications using quantum encryption. Uh, we're planning to install at least two more nodes in the near future. Uh, as we've already heard a little bit about. And at that point, then you can start sending messages to basically doing uh, chatting with, with other nodes, secure communications to other nodes. It's also critically important that we want to hear from everyone. We want to hear from you. That's so important for us. We'll be checking our email for your questions and your suggestions and your ideas about the quantum network and how it might be useful. And based on that, we will continue to develop new activities and hopefully inspired by your ideas and other ideas that we get from, from everywhere. So yeah. we hope that you'll come back, continue to learn, continue to engage, and look out for future activities that are centered around this installment. And I just want to say a big thank you to the scientists, the support staff, representatives, and the Urbana Free Library for this ho historic event. And I just want to point out, you know, the top row, those are the kind of the core research team. That's graduate students, undergraduate students under there. We have more students. We have people at UIUC that helped us get in touch with UC2B. Of course, Paul and I, and wonderful staff, wonderful communications experts. And uh, of course, UC2B, the Urbana Free Library, and all the wonderful communications experts and support uh, staff and, and, of course, funding for this work. So um, thank you to them all. And I just want to, you know, mention that it's not the end of this event either. So we have tables distributed throughout the space talking about different aspects of quantum networks, you know, things like we've talked about already, as well as new things like philosophical implications, which is really interesting, and the future of quantum networks. Also, check out iPad quantum games. We have coloring books. Please make sure to take one of those. And don't forget, liquid nitrogen just outside. <laughs> Okay, so yes, I think that covers everything. We have this website, QR code. Please visit that and see what else we're up to in the future. And yeah, we're happy to take questions if you have any questions. <laughs>